Hey everyone, I'm so glad to be here on this uh, Wix Engineering Meetup, sharing with you my last seven months working with my team uh, on infrastructure code at scale, our new provisioning system. Uh, so let's start. First, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Matan Cohen, and I'm a software development team lead at the production platform at Wix. Now, my team is a very unique one. We are software development team inside a production group. Now, our production group is uh, responsible for a, a all the Wix infrastructure, most of the Wix infrastructure, and my team responsibility is bringing a, some development practices and assimilate them in the production group. And this is a very unique situation to be. Uh, and basically, this is what uh, this meetup is all about how we took development practices and assimilated them in the production world. Before that, I, I had uh, several amazing years in WalkMe, and before that, I've been a software development, a software engineer uh, in uh, Israel Defense Forces. Now, before we start, I wanna share with you the motivation, why we started this project and what is the need. So take this architecture question. Try to think that you need to create a system, a microservice, an API, whatever, that need to expose capability of crude operations to create uh, resources in multi-cloud. So for example, you want to create an MSK, MSK it's a Kafka, a, a Kafka managed in AWS, and you need to create it as an API. You need, you need to give an API to create one, an automatic way, an automatic process. Uh, also, it can be EC2, EKS, whatever you need to create. Now, try to think why this can be a, a hard task to do. All the uh, resources that created in the cloud are created asynchronously. And you need to have some polling mechanism or some way to understand if this resource has been created successfully. Now. More than that, you need to keep the state of this resource. If it uh, was created or not, you need to use some database or other methodologies. Um, for example, if you want to create an EC2, how would you know that the instance, not just created in the cloud, but also the configuration manager, chef, uh, and other stuff was installed successfully in that machine? And you need to send the response OK just when it finished to your customers. Now, and you need to think all of this as a multi-cloud and there are a bunch of resources that you need to create. And another thing that you need to uh, take to consideration is a dependency graph. So let's say, for example, that you created one resource that was depend on another one, how you have the dependency between them, if you want to delete, for example, or some other stuff. Um, and this is the journey that my team uh, uh, went for the last year. So this is the journey agenda, and, if, uh, and each layer in the agenda will reach us to the, to, the, uh, to the goal of creating infrastructure code as a service. So we're going to start with very fast infrastructure as a code recap. What does it mean? Uh, we're going to discuss on Terraform just a little bit, and uh, we're going to discuss it on scale. Then we're going to discuss, uh, we're going to talk about InfraGAD, which is our new provisioning system and infrastructure as code as a service. And in the end, we're going to have a Q&A and some plans, uh, future plans. Cool. So what is infrastructure as code? Basically, instead of having SDKs and other stuff of changing uh, uh, clouds, you just defining some files and using CLIs on top of them to deploy your resources. And in Wix, we have a bunch of infrastructure and it's uh, splitted on several clouds. It can be AWS and GCP, and we also have Natanix. And there are other stuff uh, that Wix uh, holds uh, in the infrastructure. Now, there is a bunch of infrastructure uh, uh, as code tools. There is Chef, and Ansible, and Puppet, and Terraform, and many others. But, but in general, you can split a, a those into two major groups. There is the orchestrators, which helping you to create the resources on the cloud. And there are the configuration managers that if you're creating an EC2, for example, helping you to install stuff in that machine. Now, in this meetup, 
we're going to focus on Terraform. Uh, so what is Terraform basically? Terraform, as I said, it's an infrastructure as code, of course. But Terraform uh, is, a, is basically a wrapper for Golang. Uh, it's wrapping the SDKs, uh, and you can use providers in Terraform in order to do your deployments to the, to the different providers. So it can be uh, Azure or GCP or AWS and Kubernetes and Helm and whatever provider, pro, uh, whatever, uh, provider that have been built uh, in Go for Terraform you can use. So let's say, for example, that you want to create a, an S3 bucket, right? Uh, for the developers between us, you would probably do uh, import it doesn't matter if you're using Golang or, or Node.js or, or, or C Sharp or other language, you would probably use some SDK, right? And then you would run uh, your code. The SDK would probably do some uh, HTTP call, for example, and it will create the resource uh, in the cloud. Now, in Terraform, it's a little bit different. You are, you are defining the resource, and the resource, this is the tiniest uh, piece of how you can uh, define a, a, a resources that you want to deploy. So in this example, you can see that we have a resource S3 bucket, uh, the bucket name, uh, the access layer, et cetera. Now, if you have a bunch of resources uh, that you want to wrap in a way, you can think about it as a class kind of, and you want to reuse it, this is where module came into the picture. Now, the next thing that uh, Terraform have in, uh, in, the, in its ecosystem, it's the state. Now, Terraform, saving all the resources states in a state file. It can be saved in a lot of places. Uh, in this example, it's been saved in S3. And Terraform knows to compare between the, the, the code of the infrastructure and the cloud itself. So we always do this comparison to understand what was created and uh, what should be uh, updated or deleted, uh, etc. So. This is Terraform state in general. And also Terraform is, is keeping the dependency graph between the resources uh, in this state file. Now, Terraform have this very easy life cycle, which is Terraform in it, it's basically just downloading all the Go packages behind the scene, all the, all the provider stuff. And then you can run Terraform plan. And Terraform plan basically take your state and do the comparison between uh, the, the code that you have to the cloud. And then Terraform shows you what are you going to do? Delete, create, and other stuff. Now, if you found the plan acceptable, then you can apply this code and then it will actually change the cloud. And if you want to destroy everything and destroy the resources, you can, of course, use Terraform Destroy. Now, I'm assuming that most of you work with Terraform you are all, the, all those comments that I just spoke about are from init and plan and destroy uh, is, is you are using them in your local machine. Now, the issues with Terraform is that you can change production on your local machine without any linters, any reviewers, any CI, any CD, everything is, is, is going on on your local machine without any uh, extra review. Now, Another thing is that if you are changing production on your Terraform, uh, on your local machine, this can be a drift from production because sometimes you don't push your code to master. You just forgot. And this is a crazy thing because eventually, if you are not pushing the code, some other production engineer that's working on the same state or on the same code can cause a glitch from the cloud or from several reasons. Now. Other stuff uh, in Terraform that can cause some issues that we're gonna discuss later, it's if you are not plan planning it correctly, you would gonna end up with huge states. And also there is no authorization in Terraform. And I I I'll explain what I mean uh, authorization because of course you have IAM roles uh, in AWS, for example, that, that grants you uh, what you can do it what, and what you cannot. Now, what I mean is that if you have two production engineers, for example, that have the same uh, grants from a uh, IAM role, for example, they have both administration for EKS, they potentially can destroy one each other's code uh, if they are using the same repo. And the last piece that we're going to discuss, there is no 
Terraform as a service. There is no API to create resources. And basically, this was our wish list before we started this project. We, uh, in, in the production group, we already used Terraform, but there was so many stuff uh, that we needed to have in order to continue. Now, and this is where we came up with InfraGAD. And InfraGAD is a combination of infrastructure and gods, uh, which is very uh, funny. Uh, all our uh, microservices and consumers uh, have been taken from the Greek methodology. Uh, the Greek methodology. And this is, was, this, is, was our, this is our new project. So we had a repo with Terraform without any uh, remote execution. And on the first phase, we said that we must take it from the local machines to remote execution. And this is where we found this amazing open source called Atlantis. And Atlantis, it's basically giving you a Terraform remote execution plus GitOps. So instead of doing the Terraform plan and apply on your local machine, you can use Atlantis as a remote execution. You are writing your uh, Terraform uh, plan and, and, and apply um, on, on, Git, on, on the Git itself, on GitHub, as an issue comment. So you're writing uh, Atlantis apply, which is equivalent to Terraform apply. And this would be made as a remote execution. So there is a repo that we connected uh, to the Atlantis server that we just deployed. And basically the repo is sending all the, all the uh, GitHub events, not all of them, just a few, but it sends the relevant events to a uh, Atlantis server. And the Atlantis server eventually will do all the executions for us. Oh, sorry. And another thing that I will not go into uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this talk, there are several linters uh, for Terraform that you can add as a, as a, as a GitHub action or some, other, uh, uh, or some other CI tool. And we also created the Atlas, uh, which is our own linter that we added some uh, capabilities. For example, we want to add some tags or enforce some, some code that is relevant to our internal organization. Um, by the way, fun fact, uh, Atlantis is the island of Atlas in the Greek methodology. Cool. So let's see a quick demo how Atlas, uh, how Atlantis is working uh, uh, in GitHub. Cool. So I created this uh, demo repo that's called the InfraGAD Meetup. And this, uh, um, this repo is connected to Atlantis uh, behind the scene and it sends uh, uh, the webhooks. So, let me uh, share with you the code, the repository. Okay, cool. So I will. I, I have. A, I have a, just a simple command line uh, that uh, I answered to this repo before. So let's do, do make a project, and the team name would be DBA, for example, and the project name would be Cool Cool Project Seventeen. Okay. And I want to have the default DCs, for example. So you can see that uh, basically what I've done is I created a, 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 a directory for DBA and I created a new project for them. And there is AWS and GCP and 42 is just an alias uh, that we are calling uh, our uh, regions in AWS. So we're going to create a new, a new you know what, before I, I will create uh, this file, uh, let me push this. Into, uh, into GitHub. So let's create a demo 17, for example. Cool. Let's push this one. First demo. OK. Oh, sorry. OK, cool. So let's create this pull request. And let's see what happened when I'm pushing the Terraform code into GitHub. And I just push uh, um, the default stuff that we are creating, which is, uh, I will show you in a, in a second. Um, this is just, uh, we said, what is the provider and where is our backend? Nothing fancy here. So as you can see, when I created a new pull request, Atlantis uh, have done 
Uh, there, there is Atlantis plan webhook that went to the Atlantis server. And now, instead of having uh, the plan on my machine, I see it on GitHub, as you can see here. And by the way, I have three states that I'm working uh, in parallel at the moment. So I have uh, my cool project on AWS on 42 and 96, which both of them, as I said before, it's an alias to region, to different regions. And there is uh, a Asia uh, on GCP. So as you can see again, um, there is three plans that ran in parallel. One, one for each state, and I, I, I created the three states right now. So as you can see here, I have this new state, nothing, uh, infrastructure is up to date, and it's the same on the others. So let's go here and just create this very uh, main TF. Let's create an S3 bucket, just for example. So uh, we're going to create a resource, uh, S3 bucket, dummy. And let's create a bucket. Let's give it a name, my cool bucket. And just want to make sure that nobody have done it. So let's add a UUID to this one. OK. And an ACL. Sorry. ACL. Let's see if I can. Wait a sec. Okay. Cool. So what I've done, I just created a, a, an S3 bucket. I didn't push it yet, so let's do it. And I've done it just on on one uh, state. So let's uh, push this code again. So let's see what happening on GitHub. So you would see that I have another plan now. And this is, this is my second commit, as you can see here. And let's wait a few seconds. OK, so now you would see that a plan was created for me uh, inside uh, AWS 42. And this bucket will be created as a remote execution. So if I want to apply uh, this resource, like for the equivalent Atlantis, uh, for the equivalent of Terraform apply, I can just do here Atlantis apply. And now you would see that we were going to have a new webhook that uh, is equivalent to Terraform apply, as, as I said, and we're going to wait, and that's it. This uh, resource has just been created uh, in remote execution. And you can see also that th uh, this was uh, the uh, Atlantis have done apply for the rest of my, for the, for the uh, other states that I'm working on. By the way, I can do, I, I can do a, a Atlantis apply just for one of the states. I, I don't need to do it for all. So cool. And let's refresh because it seemed like it's stuck. Okay. And I configured Atlantis in a way that each time you are doing an apply, the code would be merged automatically. So now in InfraGAD Meetup, we have a new project for DBA, and we have a state with the, the, this Terraform file and this S3 bucket was created. So now let's just do, uh, let's go to master. I will zoom in here as well, hopefully. Okay, so let's, uh, I, I just uh, went to master and I'm going to create a new, a, a new branch. Sorry. Let's destroy DBA or something. <laughs> cool. And now I want to go here and I want to destroy this bucket. So if I would just delete, you know what? Let's let's update this one before. So let's do an update before. Yes, 
first demo. Okay, cool. Let's give it a second. So now again, Atlantis paying attention that there is a Terraform files that have been changed. And now you can see that I just changed one state. So now Atlantis said that you're going to destroy and create because uh, this was changed eventually. So this is how Atlantis is working. Cool. So let's close this pull request. By the way, if I've done Atlantis supply, as you've seen before, and, and it's going on like this. Okay. So what we achieved when we just entered Atlantis? In very easy uh, uh, implementation, you would achieve CI and CD very fast. And uh, also, the way we configured Atlantis, there is no drift with master and production because each time you are doing apply, the resource is automatically merged to production. You can, I mean, it's configurable. You can, you, you don't, you, uh, it's not must to do it, but this is the way we picked. Now, we also have remote execution now. So people uh, that having, uh, let's, for, let's say, for example, there is no differentiation between Terraform versions uh, between one, com one Miloco machine to another. And this is also great. And Atlantis didn't, didn't give us the linters, but in our other repos, we added those linters as, an, as another GitHub action. Okay, so let's discuss about, about states, about uh, states in, in, in general in, in Terraform. Now, Terraform, as I said before, is built on top of Golang. And if you, are, if you wrote in Go, you probably know that each directory in Go, uh, it's like a different package. And Terraform is working the same way. Each, each folder in Terraform have its own states. So the way you are organizing your folders, it's the way that you are organizing your states. And when you think about, uh, if you don't uh, think about uh, your directory structure in a good way, you can go to those uh, issues. For example, you can step on each other's toes, which means that two people, let's say, for example, that you have this huge state, right? And, and two production engineers working on the same state there can be a lot of glitches there. They can do, uh, they can break each other. By the way, Atlantis is giving you a, lo a locking mechanism out of the box, so this partly, partly would be solved. Also, if you have a huge state, sometimes things change in the cloud. Sometimes there are drifts for many reasons. And if you have a huge state, eventually you're gonna end up for each plan, you're gonna see a lot of changes that you uh, didn't do uh, in your in your uh, code a uh, pull request, and another thing that if you having a, a, if you have a, a, a huge state eventually Terraform plan would can take some can take minutes eventually. So let's think how we can organize our directories. Now this is a very simple component oriented structure, which means that I just have a Terraform folder and I keeping all my stuff on files. It can be, uh, for example, servers TF uh, EC2, for example, and you keeping all your stuff inside EC2 TF and Elasticsearch and RDS and everything. Now, if you think about it as a component oriented, this is not a scalable manner in, in a, a, when, when, you, when your infrastructure is going to grow. Now, you may think also that you're gonna have a cloud oriented structure, which means that you wanna take the way the cloud uh, is look like. For example, you have uh, two cloud and you wanna use AWS and GCP and you will split it to the regions and inside the regions, you have your components. As you can see here, uh, for example, AWS and you have US East one and US East two and you have a, diff a different uh, EKS in, in two regions. Now, this is also problematic. Try to think that you have a team, right, uh, in your organization that need to create some uh, infrastructure. And uh, there is a, pro and, and this team have a project. And this project can be, from some reason, uh, uh, not be relevant anymore. And you need to delete all the resources that related to this uh, project. So you need to go in and search all the uh, infrastructure in all of, uh, all of those directories and need to understand when the where is the infrastructure and how to delete it. 
So this is where we picked up with business-oriented structure. Now, by the way, all of this will lead us eventually to the infrastructure as code as a service. Um, so there, there is the, those two main uh, the, uh, directories that we have on the root, which is live and modules. Live, actually, it's, it's all the things that uh, actually been created in the cloud. So, and the modules, as I said before, those are kind of the classes that we are using uh, for reusable uh, Terraform code. Now, the main two directories that I want uh, to focus on on this structure is the team and the project. We didn't start it from the provider, from the AWS or GCP. We didn't start from the cloud. We start from the team and the project. And this way, we are keeping our infrastructure uh, uh, in Terraform scalable. Now, each time you have a project, I mean, for each team, for each team we have a separate uh, uh, folder which will cause uh, not uh, touching each other's people uh, infrastructure. And more than that, if you have two projects, again, you have this separation. And if in one project you have a different cloud providers, for example, AWS and GCP, again, you have this separation and you can go uh, going on. But where you started from, this is the most critical. Uh, uh, this is the most critical to split it uh, first to the team and the project. Now the modules uh, are also uh, is the same way. We are, we have the modules also started from team name. We also have a common which is like shared the Terraform that you are writing. Um, I will not touch this, but we are also keeping our module versions in Git uh, and not like a reference. And this can help. This is helping us a lot. Uh, when we need to deprecate some version. And th this is just like, a, a, um, like you're writing an API, right? And you want to have different versions. Uh, and this is, uh, helps us a lot. Uh, cool. So this is the major, uh, the major thing. As long as you keep your uh, states tiny, your life would be much easier uh, in, with working with Terraform. Now, after uh, uh, discussing about the states, let's discuss a little bit about the authorization in Terraform. So, as I said before, you have authorization when you are touching the cloud, of course. You have, uh, you have IAM rules and other stuff. But we want to have the capability of keeping uh, authorization on the Terraform code itself, not letting people that not relevant touching the code. Now, probably some of you using multi-repo, which is fine, but as long that you would keep grow and grow, you will need to have this capability in the same uh, repo. And this is where we came up with GitHub code owners. Now, GitHub code owners, this is just a native capability of GitHub that you can keep authorization uh, on the files uh, inside a, a repo. Uh, and it can be a monorepo, of course. Now, this is a code owner file uh, inside the, this is a, a, an example of code owner file. And this is just a file that you put on the root of your direct, on the GitHub uh, uh, directory. And this is it basically. So let's understand what's written here. So the first example is that if you have a, a wildcard.js, JS owner, this is mean that Anytime people uh, that are changing uh, JavaScript files inside my repo, automatically someone uh, from the JS owner team or a person would be automatically added to review this code. And you cannot uh, uh, enter your code until the pull request is approved. Uh, you can see the, the, another example here that you are using regex uh, for, I mean, apps will be under the responsibility of the user Octocat. So anytime someone will touch this folder, Octocat will must approve this, um, this pull request. Now, so basically you are using regex to understand who is responsible for what in your model repo. Now, after you are uh, uh, adding code owners to your um, repo, each file will have uh, this shield that says, who is the one that's responsible for this file? And if you are inside a pull request, for example, then you're gonna have, uh, you can see on the right that 
you ma- the, the, the relevant team uh, or the persons will be added automatically to this pull request before you are changing your files. Now, how all of this is related to, to what we are speaking about, to Atlantis and everything. Now, after we added code owner to our repo, um, something very cool happened. Atlantis have this configuration inside uh, the Atlantis server that's called Mergeable. And now Mergeable, it's very, uh, it goes without saying, your pull request must be Mergeable before you are doing Atlantis supply. Meaning that if your code, for example, is not up to date and all the liters and, uh, linters and checks have not been um, uh, successfully run. And also if you didn't get an approval, all of those things making the pull request not be mergeable. And this is, this is the a general diagram of, of, of the situation here. So someone wrote Atlantis supply inside GitHub, right? And, and Atlantis is asking, is, is this pull request mergeable? And then Atlantis checks all the linters, the reviewers, the code is up to date. And if it's yes, then the Terraform apply would be executed. But if it's not, we are blocking the Terraform apply. So behind the scene, we achieved authorization with those just two simple stuff. We added mergeable configuration inside Atlantis and we also added the code owners, that's it. So instead of having a proxy microservice between GitHub and Atlantis and doing a bunch of, of stuff, we just configured uh, uh, the tools, uh, which, is, which is very nice to achieve this, uh, this uh, power of authorization uh, with this easy uh, approach. So let's do, see another demo uh, of code owners uh, of in, in GitHub repo. So first of all, I will push a code owner file into uh, the main, uh, to the root uh, directory. Just a second. Okay. Let's go to master. Okay, so I'm creating this new file, code owners. And I will add uh, some lines inside this file. Okay, so I will make it bigger so you can see. So this code owners file is basically having those. There is the Infraga team, which is my team. And this is a team that I already declared in, in, in uh, GitHub. You can configure teams in GitHub inside the, uh, inside the section of the teams. So I created uh, my team, which is Infragad, as I said, and which we are responsible for everything in the repo, but DBAs would be responsible for their stuff. So each time I'm going to change something in DBA's code, DBA will be added as a reviewers. So let's push let's let's push this uh, this code to master. And now you would see that I have this uh, new file code owners. You can see it here. But for now, uh, code owners is not doing anything now in my repo. I need to, uh, uh, I need to turn on uh, code owners in my repo. So I'm going to settings and to branches. And I will edit master. And you can see here uh, that in the section of uh, adding some uh, pull request reviewer, I am also turning on code owners. Um, you can see it here. Okay, which is makes sense that code owner is, is, is dependent on reviewer because the code owner is a reviewer eventually, a very specific one. Just a sec. Okay. 
Okay, cool. So now when I will return to the, uh, to the repo and I will uh, go enter to, to a file, you would see this shield that was added. Now I will try to uh, change DBA's code as I showed you before and let's see what's happened. So I will go back here and then I'm going to go to another branch, destroy DBA again. And here, let's delete this uh, very important S3 bucket. And I will push this code. And let's see what's happening inside the pull request. Now, you can see the DBA was uh, immediately added because of the rule we just, uh, because of the rule that we've done inside uh, uh, our repo. Now, the plan can be showed, but the apply, this is the problem. Now, before I'm, I'm doing the Atlantis supply, I want to show you how the code owners, uh, I mean, you can see that li the, the DBA's uh, files is under live DBA, etc. So the code owners is doing this regex, live DBA and everything beneath it would be added for DBA. So I will try now to do Atlantis supply and you would see what happened. Now, before I'm doing the apply, you can see that this pull request is not mergeable. When the code is mergeable, you would see everything green here. Now, when I have this code on a reviewer, this uh, pull request no longer mergeable. So I would do Atlantis apply again, and hopefully I should be blocked. Let's refresh to see. Okay. And now you see that the apply was failed. And I'm the administrator of this repo, but still it doesn't letting me uh, to, to, to apply this code. Now, of course, that I can change the code owners and I can do everything because I'm the code owner of this, uh, I'm, I'm the administrator of this repo, but it can prevent a lot of mistakes and stuff um, on the day-to-day -day when you have a lot of people that working on the same infrastructure. Cool. So after we added code owners uh, to our monorepo, as I said, we, we achieved this authorization. But still, with all of this Terraform, uh, let's call it best practices or uh, and whatever, we didn't solve the problem of Terraform as a service. And we think we thought a lot what we can do in order to solve this question. We've done some POCs with SDK and Pulumi and Terraform, and we didn't know what is the best way to go. And eventually we said that we're gonna use what we have, which is InfraGuard repo, Atlantis as a remote execution, and we're gonna take this layer on, and on top of that, we're gonna create our InfraGuard API. And this is just a high level of what we have. Uh, this is not all the components, but it, it giving the, the general idea of what we did. So anytime a serve, an automated service or, or, or developer uh, that wants to create something automatically, he uh, wants to create a, a, or to do any crude operation, actually, this uh, call will reach to InfraGuard API. And InfraGuard API would produce to Kafka the message that uh, would be responsible for this uh, resource. And we have this GitHub consumer that you can, this is actually writing Terraform for us uh, as a user. And he will using all the Atlantis supply and plan and everything in order to do so. And everything that you already saw, those are the next steps. Now, the problem here, another problem is that everything is asynchronously. So first of all, when someone is doing a crude operation to us, we must give him a polling URL. 
something that you can uh, uh, understand when the resource was, was created, because as I said, any resource that you created, that you're creating in the cloud is asynchronously created. And also GitHub and everything is asynchronously here. Now, so what we've done is a very simple thing. We, we, had, a, we had a correlation ID all over the process here, and we are keeping it in a, a, a elastic hash, and, which is Redis eventually. And anytime someone is, is doing uh, this polling, we, we updating all over the process, if it's on GitHub or, or uh, inside the, the cloud or a, a configuration manager is running right now. So we updated uh, uh, Redis on each phase. And that way, when you are polling this URL, then we're giving the, the exact response here. And you may think, how could we write Terraform, uh, Terraform uh, uh, programmatically? So of course we can use some Go templates and other stuff, crazy stuff to, to, to write HCL, which is uh, the, native, the most common, uh, most, uh, common uh, use of Terraform. But there is a native way to write in Terraform as JSON, which is very cool. And when we have JSON, any programmatic lang any, 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 uh, language can be easily worked with the JSON. It doesn't matter if you're using Node.js or Golang or C-Shop, it doesn't matter. You can work with a JSON. So we're writing our Terraform as a JSON. And this is just an example of, um, of an EC2 that we created. Uh, with uh, this is a, 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 an EC2 that we created as JSON uh, programmatically, and before we continue, we need uh, before I'm going to the demo, we need to think on on another on other uh, stuff here uh, on on, and this is kind of a development difficulty when you are having such a, a such a system that has so many. Uh, differences between uh, the interfaces along the way. For example, you need to create a REST API, right? So you need to think, uh, you need to create uh, all the, 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 the routes and the controllers and everything. And if you need to have a gRPC as well, so you need to, to work with the gRPC and, the Kafka, and the, the Kafka message would eventually go to Kafka. So you need to have this interface. So if someone, for example, wants to create an EC2, we need to think along the way how we're keeping this interface all the way. And also to the, to the Terraform module, we need to have like a, an EC2 module in Terraform eventually to accept it. So this can be very tedious when you are need to create a lot of resources. If you're doing it once, okay, so work with JSON. But if you have to create a lot of resources, then you need to think about maybe a, a, a better approach here. And this is where we took protocol, protocol buffers to solve this situation. Now, protobuf is a very simple thing, actually. It's a, it's a, a Google language to define uh, structs and other stuff. And you can generate from it uh, interfaces and, and gRPC and, and other stuff uh, from, uh, from this protobuf. So you can see on the left that I have a message uh, person. And eventually, I can use it in many languages like Java and C++ and other languages, of course. Now, take this example. This is a real example. In the left, we are defining an EC2 instance. And you can see that there is the instance type and MIID and everything. Now, we are using, automatically we are generating Go structs from that. And of course, we have the gRPC and everything and also the REST API. Um, but we also can potentially, uh, if, you are over, if you are creating another uh, plugin for, for Proto, you can also create the Terraform variables for you. So eventually you are using the same interface all over the system. You are declaring it just once and you are using it all over. And this is just an example of how to use the, the, the message instance that I just showed. So we have this uh, instant service. And you can see here that we are not writing the, the API here. We, are write, we will implement the RPC and we will get for free the post and um, 
all the checks and all the validations and everything that you want that you, we want to have eventually. We just need to implement it, but we have just one place to declare it. And we're going to have a gRPC REST API for free and for this. Now, before I'm uh, reaching to the last demo, I just want to uh, uh, discuss on InfraGuard API lifecycle. This is not all the lifecycle, but those are the main, um, those are the main uh, layers of, of the lifecycle. So there is the lifecycle scheduled, meaning that uh, we, we accepted the, the, the request and the lifecycle processing, meaning that this is uh, on GitHub uh, for now, and lifecycle configuring, meaning that Chef is running in the machine. We're going to see a demo for Chef. Uh, for, for creating an instance and there is a chef and other stuff that will run inside. And we're gonna say, okay, just when all of those, all of this process is finished. So what I'm showing you now, this is a tool called Spinnaker. Uh, and basically one of the problems of writing such a service is that you need to test yourself a lot. So what we have, it's we testing all day and we uh, are doing a, a crude operation on the instance, for example. And what we are doing here is you can see that we create instance, get instance, modify instance. Uh, just a second, let me make it a little bit bigger. So we are doing it all day. And we see uh, if we have a problem with, with our mechanism. So let's start a manual execution and see what happened. So, what you can see here is that I have just uh, done an, an API call to our InfraGuard API to create an EC2. Now, now the process has just started. So you see that we are in lifecycle processing. And this is the request ID, the correlation ID between all the system. And it goes with the Kafka messages and, and inside to the cloud, inside Chef. And everybody is aware of this request ID. So just for example, I would go here inside GitHub, uh, InfraGuard API, and you would see this pull request. Uh, we have the, uh, this request ID as, um, as the correlation also here. So now you would see that everything was made for us. We are running Atlantis as a service. So you see that now uh, we have a new comment of Atlantis supply and I think it will take it something around um, two minutes, I think, until it will end. Uh, just a second. Uh, something around three minutes, five minutes. It depends of, of a lot of stuff. If uh, chef, how, how fast uh, chef ran and other stuff. Uh, let's give it a minute uh, until it's finished. This is not the one, sorry. This is the one, okay. So, Basically, um, you can see that it's, it's still processing and we're gonna give it just a few seconds to see when it's gonna be changed uh, to, um, oh, now it's finished and it's already merged. And we're gonna change from lifecycle processing to lifecycle configuring. And configuring, as I said, mean that now is, there is all the installations under the hood uh, inside the machine. So the, the, the system that is calling us will know that just when we're gonna reach lifecycle, okay, this is the time that the machine is actually um, uh, ready. But if you don't care about chef and other stuff, so uh, I mean, you probably need to wait anyhow because the DNS uh, will be registered inside the chef. So uh, we're gonna wait a few seconds give it, uh, to see uh, how it's gonna look like when it's gonna finish. And just one sec. Okay, so in the meanwhile, I can show you that we are using a, a redash uh, for keeping all our logs. And you can see that uh, eventually the logs is all, all the logs from all the consumers. It's like a story. We can see on each phase where, where, where was the, the, the uh, how every consumer and every, every resource handled the request. Now, Let's see if it's finished already. Still running. I think it will take, his, take it uh, like 15, maybe 20 seconds. And if not, we're gonna continue.
Okay, now you see that there is a DNS that added to this machine. By the way, those are all test machines. And all, again, Titans, part of the Greek mythology. And now it's lifecycle okay. This machine is ready to use. And eventually we're gonna delete this in, in, a, in a minute uh, when this pipeline uh, would be ended. Okay, cool. So our wish list has ended. Um, telling the truth, the wish list was much longer than this, and this was didn't finish yet. We have a very big backlog. <laughs> telling the truth, but those are the main things that, uh, for let's say, for the first phase of what we needed to solve. Uh, our next plans, um, it's having an InfraGuard app. We already have one, but it's very on, uh, uh, on early stages, a React app that basically showing a multi-cloud project dashboard uh, that our customers can see uh, both AWS and Google and all the resources that they created in one place um, uh, very easily. And another thing that uh, there is a problem, not a problem, but something that's missing inside um, Atlantis is that there is no live apply and like live Terraform uh, status. So for example, if you are creating an MSK, you need to wait 17 minutes in average to create one. So you just need to believe that eventually you would see the, uh, the apply. So we're gonna wanna give our customers a better uh, approach, a, a, better, a better UI, a, a better uh, user experience when using uh, Atlantis. And hopefully we're gonna open source everything, our linters and InfraGuard API and all this mechanism. Uh, so stay tuned 